you know, there were two ribbons, marker ribbons in the book, and I wasn't sure which one it was, so I took the first one. Actually, the right course of the verse is the second one, but I was thinking it would be nice to speak on this verse, which is here, because it's, it's central to Srila Prabhupada's mission. So I'll read it. It's a well-known verse. Tapyante loka tapena sadava prayasho janaha paramaradhanam dhadhi purushasya kila nanaha. Translation. It is said that great personalities almost always accept voluntary suffering because of the suffering of people in general. This is considered the highest method of worshipping the Supreme Personality of Godhead who is present in everyone's heart. Purport. Here is an explanation of how those engaged in activities for the welfare of others are very quickly recognized by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Lord says in Bhagavad Gita, Ya idam paramangu hyam mad bhaktesvabhidhasiti Nachatas man manushye shu kaschenme priyakritamaha one who preaches the message of Bhagavad Gita to my devotees is most dear to me. No one can excel him in satisfying me by worship. There are different kinds of welfare activities in this material world, but the supreme welfare activity is the spreading of Krishna consciousness. Other welfare activities cannot be effective, for the laws of nature and the results of karma cannot be checked. It is by destiny or the laws of karma that one must suffer or enjoy. For instance, if one is given a court order, he must accept it, whether it brings suffering or profit. Similarly, everyone is under obligations to karma and its reactions. No one can change this. Therefore, the Shastra says, Tasyaiva he tov prayate tako vido nalabhyate yad brahmatamu. Upriyadaha. One should endeavor for that which is never obtained by wandering up and down the universe as a result of the reactions of karma. What is that? Hmm. One should endeavor to become Krishna conscious. If one tries to spread Krishna consciousness all over the world, he should be understood to be performing the best welfare activity. The Lord is automatically very pleased with him. If the Lord is pleased with him, what is left for him to achieve? If one has been recognized by the Lord, even if he does not ask the Lord for anything, the Lord, who is within everyone, supplies him whatever he wants. Mm. This is also confirmed in Bhagavad Gita. Again, as stated here, Tapyante lokata pena sadava prayasho janaha. The best welfare activity is raising people to the platform of Krishna consciousness, since the conditioned souls are suffering only for want of Krishna consciousness. The Lord Himself also comes to mitigate the suffering of humanity. Yada yada hi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata. Abhyuthanam adharamasya tada anam srijamyaham paritranaya sadhunam vinashaya chatushkutam dharma sangstha anarthaya sambhavami yuge yuge. Whenever and wherever there is a decline in religious practice or descendant of Bharat and a prominent rise of irreligion, at that time I descend myself to deliver the pious and to annihilate the miscreants, as well as to re-establish the principles of religion. I advent myself millennium after millennium. All the Shastras conclude, therefore, that spreading the Krishna consciousness movement is the best welfare activity in the world. Because of the ultimate benefit this bestows upon people in general, the Lord very quickly recognizes such service performed by a devotee. Tapas Prabhu has thanked me for coming here. Well, I'm thanking you for being here and flying the flag of Prabhupada's movement. 
in this blessed land of Sweden. Sweden is a very sacred place, you know that? Prabhupada came here. Prabhupada purified the whole world by striding all over it and asking everyone to chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Krishna Hare, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, 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 It appears that preaching Krishna consciousness in Sweden is it's not the easiest place to preach in as much as the temperament or the culture, the local culture is not very conducive for Krishna consciousness. So it's just to live here is tapasya. Austerity, and what to speak of preaching Krishna consciousness here. But as Lord Shiva states here, prior to drinking the poison that had been produced from the churning of the milk ocean, that was so virulent that it just, by being there, it threatened to choke the whole universe to destroy such powerful poison. Lord Shiva volunteered to drink it. So Lord Shiva is not killed by such an activity, but it appears that it must some difficulty must have been. It must, have, must at least have burned his throat. At least, because he's speaking of it as an aust- it is an austerity to do so. And people, others may be surprised, why is he taking austerity? Lord Shiva is known as a great tapasvi, austere person. Even though he has so much power, he can destroy universes, he can also create universes. His wife is Durga Devi, under whose supervision, Srishti, Stiti, Pralaya, Sadhana, Shakti, Eka, Chayeva, Yasya, Bhuvanani, Vibharti, Durga. The creation, maintenance and destruction of the universe go on under the supervision of Durga Devi. She acts as the shadow potency of Lord Vishnu acting under, under, according to his wish. And she acts under the supervision of Lord Shiva. Now she supplies all material boons for those who pray to her. But she doesn't even have a house to live in herself because Lord Shiva is so renounced that he just lives under a tree. So he's accustomed to austerities. He takes so many difficulties. Lord Shiva is known as Vaishnavanam Yatha Shambhu. He's given as an example of great Vaishnava, but he doesn't behave like an ordinary Vaishnava. Vaishnavas, they generally, they, even in the, not only generally, but even in the Shastras, it's stated that Vaishnavas, they should wear Urdhva Pundra, this, this kind of tilak going upwards, Urdhva. They should be very clean. They should avoid impurities. These are prescriptions for any civilized person. And Vaishnavas are the most civilized. But Lord Shiva has the uh, three-line tila, three pundra, which his followers also the so-called followers. And he's covered with ashes from the crematorium, which is pretty much the most impure thing. The ashes of dead bodies is smeared on his body. He takes charge of the (coughs) practically unhelpable people. Achikitsya. They're, 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 they're not treatable. 
the, the, the ghosts, the Dakini, Pishaj, all the uh, hobgoblins and the people who are in the worst level of consciousness, the lowest in the universe, wholly in the mode of ignorance, and the Mayavadis, they're in the same category. So Lord Shiva takes charge of them, he becomes their leader, and just to help them, that they can at some point, in some way, take to the Vedic processes. By contacting him, who is a great Vaishnava, uh, they can have some kind of purification. Very little purification is possible in that mode of life. But that is a great austerity for him. So he's preparing to accept more austerity now, drinking the ocean of poison. So it must have been difficult for him also. Otherwise, why would he say? If it was just an easy thing for him, then he wouldn't mention that it's... He, he admits it's a, it's a difficult thing to do. But anyway, I will do it. Because voluntarily, tapyante, they... They, Prabhupada translates this as voluntary suffering. Sometimes we say, oh, it's, it's a great austerity, I was just saying it's a great austerity to live in Sweden. But the, the concept of tapasya, although it's translated as austerity, um, it doesn't really have a... Uh, as far as I know, unless it's one of those dead words in the English language, like words or dead or dying words, words like sin, or adultery, or fornication, they're, they're dying words. People don't use them anymore because there's no concept. Of, the concept is dying. So maybe there is a word for fornication, you know what that means? That means sex outside marriage. It's, it's considered a great sin, but you don't hear the word anymore because people don't consider it a sin and they don't even believe that there's any such thing as sin. So there might be such a word in Old English, but the concept tapasya, this gives the idea of voluntarily suffering. And Well, there, there is a term, it's called masochism, in which one in, inflicts pain on oneself. But that is also considered to be people who, masochists are people who inflict pain upon themselves for the sake of of getting some perverted pleasure. So the idea is that one will get pleasure by doing so. But the concept of tapasya is not like that. Tapasya is accepted, voluntary suffering. Uh, one reason is to... so that one can invoke auspiciousness on oneself, or to cancel out some inauspiciousness. If one has done some sinful activity, he can take some prayas chitta, some atonement, so he may accept tapasya for that. For instance, if you kill a spider, you may go and be, be told, you have to perform the chandrayana vrata of eating one month, once a day, you have to put the food on the floor, and you lean forward and eat from the ground. And on the first day of the moon, you can take one mouthful. On the second day, you can take two mouthfuls. On the third day, like that. And when you get up to Purnima, the 15th day, the next day it goes back again to 14, 30. And, that's your, and if you sit up, then you have to stop. So that is difficult. That's Chandrayana Vrata. So that's a kind of tapasya. So one may do that to cancel out the effects of a sin that one commits, or one may do so, like Hiranyakashipu also performed tapasya, for the sake of attaining power for future sense gratification. Rishabdev spoke of tapo divyam, divine austerities. That means austerities that are accepted for spiritual upliftment, for purification of heart. 
So living in Sweden is austere, but just by living here, um, well, in one sense, one becomes purified just by living here, in one sense. In the sense that birth in such a horrible place, if you don't mind me saying so. It's a reaction to sinful activity. So by, by being born in such an impious place, where it's dark most of the year, or a large part of the year, very cold, then uh, one, by doing so, one's, the reaction that has caused one to be born in such a place is gradually negated. So in that sense, it's a kind of purification. One becomes free from the sinful activities that cause one to be born in such a place. But that's, that's not actually purification of heart. No, that doesn't actually... It, it, it's just like serving a prison sentence or something like that. In Finland, our, the rented rooms we have as a temple are one floor up from the Finnish branch of Amnesty International, which is probably very popular in the Scandinavian countries. But ISKCON is the real Amnesty International. We really, our aim is to release everyone from prison. The whole material world is a big prison. So they think that they're helping people to get out of prison. They should just go up one floor and realize that you're in prison too. <laughs> you, did, you think you're free, but you're controlled by your senses. So tapo divyam means those austerities performed for purification of consciousness, to come to the divine platform. That means beyond the three modes of material nature. Tapasya performed within the three modes of material nature. Or, well, it's just, there's austerity which is accepted within the three modes of nature, just like being born anywhere in the material world, or especially in impious places or taking birth in the hellish planets, that means that uh, involuntarily one accepts austerity. And one may voluntarily accept austerity, as Hiranyakashi put it, but his motive was not pure, his motive was quite impure. How he could dominate others, how he could give tapa, Tapa means, literally means heat. So how he could make life hot for others. How he could make life difficult for others. That was his aim. Ravana means who makes the whole world cry. So he liked that. He was such a demon that he took pleasure in giving displeasure to others. So such a position is achieved by austerity. But that kind of austerity is not good. One should accept austerity for uplifting, becoming uplifted to the platform of divine consciousness. Tapo divyam putuga yena satham yasmad brahma sokyam tvanantam. Rishabdi advised his sons, you accept that austerity by which we can, you can be lifted to the divine platform beyond birth and death of unlimited spiritual bliss. Now here Lord Shiva, who is, although appearing very inauspicious because he's surrounded by all kinds of ghostly beings, he has crematorium ashes on his body and serpents, swathed around his body. He's actually very auspicious. His name Shiva means auspicious. He's already transcendentally situated. So he doesn't have to perform austerities to become transcendentally situated. He already is transcendentally situated. But he is here describing <coughs> austerity for an even higher purpose than self-purification. That is for the sake of benefiting others. Prabhupada mentions here, there are different kinds of welfare activities in this material world, but the supreme welfare activity is the spreading of Krishna consciousness. So there are so many welfare societies, I was just mentioning, Amnesty International, 
How many are there? Save the dog, save the whale, save the earth, ecological movement. So, the motive behind them may be good in some ways, but it's misplaced due to a lack of knowledge of what is actual welfare. That we cannot actually help anyone. First of all, we, we should help ourselves. We don't know what a bad situation. If we attempt to help others, that means we presume we're in a better position. But without knowledge of Krishna consciousness, of our actual welfare, then, uh, as Prabhupada gave the example, so-called helping others, compassion for others, it's like blowing on a boil. Who's had boils? Boil, you know what this is? This swells up with pus. Who's had? No, no. It's infection. It's it's very painful, very painful. Especially if you have a big one or an abscess. It's an internal. I used to get lots. And then one Ayurvedic doctor told me, "Do you eat eggplant?" Yes. Stop it. I stopped it. I didn't get anyone. I had allergy to eggplants. It's a common allergy. I got this in the mouth when I was in India. Too much, hmm? too much chili. Chili, uh, they're all in the same family. Eggplant, tomato, uh, deadly nightshade, chili, peppers, bell peppers. They're all in the same family. Pita. Pita, yeah. It's like eating fire. <laughs> so... It's a common allergy. Begun is nirgun in Bengali, they say. Begun means eggplant, and nirgun has no qualities. It has no nutritive value. It tastes nice if it's cooked properly. It's not good. Anyway, we're talking about boils. So, if you have a boil, it's very painful. You can't understand this example unless you've had a boil. So someone may come and say, oh, I'll help you, I'll, I'll blow on it. So it, may, it might give a very, very slight relief. But the real relief, or another thing they do, they give you antibiotics. And what that does, it, it, re, it practically it redistributes the poison all over the body, so you get more oils. It doesn't, it, it's symptom, it's symptomatic, it's not exactly symptomatic treatment, but it doesn't really solve the problem. So uh, what you do over a boil, you have to wait till it's fully ripe and lance it. Here. Still got a few scars here. This is from the hospital in Lajpat Nagar in Delhi, which they did. I had to ask the guy to... Uh, Put, his, put out his beard and wash his hand before he did it. So, no anesthetic. I walked back to the temple. I felt like I was going to pass out. I, could, I was in the evening. I couldn't sleep all night. So, I thought at that time, uh, I really want to be Krishna conscious because if the, uh, material life means this and worse, life after life, it's a very good incentive to be Krishna conscious. Very painful. So the cure for this pain of the boil is the pain of the knife. One pain cures another, or cures another pain. There's no other way around it. So to accept austerity for the sake of spiritual uplift, that is intrinsic to spiritual culture. Not, not only in India, in the Christian tradition, that was also there. Before joining this movement, I was staying with a sect of... Oh, nowadays the word sect is a bad word. In those days, it, was, it wasn't. But uh, Cistercian monks, whose habit was to... or uh, practice was to rise every day before three o'clock in the morning and chant prayers together, kind of sankirtan. 
until about eight o'clock in the morning. So that's austere, isn't it? But they volunteer, and of course they're celibate. So they accept that austerity because they have a higher ideal of God consciousness. So that was all over the world. In uh, in the Shia Islamic culture, the Muharram, they they flagellate themselves. That they they whip them on a certain day. So it's like to show empathy. So. That's pretty tamas. But the idea that one should accept some kind of suffering or, or voluntarily accept some difficulty for the sake of spiritual uplift, that is central to spiritual life because the spirit of enjoyment of this material world is exactly opposite to Krishna consciousness. Krishna conscious means to accept that we are to be enjoyed by Krishna. And material consciousness means I am the enjoyer. Ishvara aham aham bhogi. I am the controller. I am the enjoyer. Krishna in Bhagavad Gita mentions this as the demoniac attitude. This demoniac attitude is prevalent even in most of the world's religions, in which they think, I am the enjoyer, and God's big brother enjoyer, so he helps me to enjoy. This is why the Krishna consciousness is unique, in that it begins with rejecting what Vyasadeva calls cheating religion, dharma, Ojita, Kaitava Atra, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, cheating religion is rejected. So the idea that God is our order supplier, give me this, give me that, give me something else, I will go to heaven and enjoy myself by the grace of God, or I will enjoy here. It's, it's not actually God consciousness, or, or at a very low level. It's God consciousness, devoid of knowledge of God, and they don't know who he is or what it means to be God. To be God means to be the supreme enjoyer, the supreme object of everyone's uh, activities. Mm. And mm. they don't know what it means to be God, and they don't know how to relate to him. They are bereft of Sambandha Gyan, knowledge of who is God, what does it mean to be God? They say he's the supreme, but how is he the supreme? How do we relate to him? People can only imagine relating to him that, well, if he's superior to us and he likes us, then he should provide us facilities for sense gratification. That's why people, when there's floods, famines, and then they, they, people, they lose their faith in God. Or why didn't God stop it? If, he's, if God is good, then he should stop all this. Why does he allow all these things to happen? They, they cannot understand. They don't understand that the laws of karma are working. We have made this situation by not accepting our position as servants of the Supreme Lord. We are to act solely for His pleasure. So this is... Actual religion begins with understanding this, but nevertheless it is difficult for the conditioned souls to get free from the enjoying spirit. Those who are engaged in Vaidhi, sadhana, bhakti, and Krishna consciousness can attest to this. That though we chant Hare Krishna, it is difficult to get free from the spirit that I am to enjoy. And even if we uh, get free from the 
activities of grossly enjoying this material world. We, we forswear meat-eating, gambling, illicit sex, intoxication. And even if we do that, and it's not everyone in the Krishna conscious world who does that, but then there are other temptations such as sports, and movies, and TV, and karmi food. And even if you get beyond all that, then there's still the desire to be honored for doing so. It's very difficult to get free from the spirit of sense gratification. Even while we're ostensibly serving the Lord, we may be cultivating more the desire for being honored for doing so. It's a great stumbling block, the desire for being noticed. That one plays the Madanga very nicely and thinking, yeah, everyone's noticing how nicely I'm playing. Whatever it may be, I mean, someone may be very learned and loves to hear people say, oh, he's a great scholar. Uh, one may be very renounced, not engaging in sense gratification. People say, oh, you are very austere. Oh, wow. And just to hear that, one may be very austere and all his austerities, he gets a reward in hearing time to time people say, he's very austere. And if he finds this sweeter than nectar to hear these words, but that is not the goal of austerity. That, uh, that means we got sidetracked by maya into the same propensity. That even though we are engaged in activities which are meant for giving up sense gratification on the subtle platform, we are doing, we're doing the same thing. Maybe not in such a gross way as others, but it's the same basic desire. That's why sometimes we become surprised that someone who is practicing Krishna consciousness very nicely, and then they, they fall into grossly materialistic. How did that happen? It didn't happen overnight. It's going on inside, like cultivating the wrong things. So austerity is accepted to give to overcome the spirit of personal enjoyment. But that austerity is not perfect unless it is completely centered on how to give enjoyment to Krishna. That's why in Vaishnavism, Vaishnav Dharma, severe austerities are not emphasized. Although we see in the past some devotees have done so, but it's, it's not very much recommended because the real thing is to please Krishna. Therefore, Narad Muni says, Aradito yadi harishtapasatatakim Naradito yadi harishtapasatatakim That if one is worshipping Krishna, then what is the need of performing austerities? if one is fully absorbed in serving Krishna. And if you don't worship Krishna, then again, what's the point in observing or doing austerities? And what, what did we all come to anyway? So either way, austerity in and of itself is not purifying. But accepting difficulty in the course of performing Krishna conscious activities that is purifying. For instance, if one has the choice to... Uh, well, you, you can have a choice. A, a devotee is given the service of distributing Srila Prabhupada's books, and he has the choice of going out in the cold to do so, or finding something else to do inside in the warm weather. If it's, but if it's necessary to perform his service, to accept the difficulty of going in the cold, then that austerity is an austerity that is accepted for Krishna consciousness. And it is austerity. It's, it's difficult, no doubt, to go out in the cold in the winter in these countries. But devotees do so because they want to please Krishna. So they're not just giving up the spirit of personal sense enjoyment, but they're doing so for the, hopefully for the higher motive of pleasing Krishna. 
So Krishna is very pleased with that. Lord Shiva mentions here that there is no higher way of worshipping the Lord than accepting difficulties for the sake of benefiting others. Now we may say, well, how did drinking the poison benefit others in a Krishna conscious way? Well, in and of itself, drinking the poison doesn't help people to become Krishna conscious, but it helps them to stay alive. And it's difficult to be Krishna conscious if you're not in a human birth. So if they all have to die, that would be a great disaster for the whole universe. And in such, in such chaotic conditions, it's difficult for people to take to Krishna conscious. Plus there is suffering. There's no doubt there's suffering from... Just like in the First World War, they, they were using this mustard gas and it was very painful and horrible and people had to inhale this and, and either be severely crippled or die from it. So it, it is suffering. So Lord Shiva desires to help people get free from that suffering and not only the immediate suffering, but the whole condition of material life which is full of suffering. And Krishna himself wants people to become free from suffering. And therefore Krishna comes to this world. We've just celebrated Janmashtami. Why does Krishna come to this world? To show his pastimes so that others may be attracted to join them. To speak Bhagavad Gita so that people can get them, so that people can get the knowledge of Krishna. And then after Krishna came, after Janmashtami, we, we celebrate Srila Prabhupada's Vyasa Puja. He comes to tell everyone about Krishna. So these two days are over on Vyasa Puja day, especially on this day. Every day we we aspire to remember Srila Prabhupada his mission and his service at every moment. But especially on Vyasa Puja Day becomes the, the uh, formal object of our discussion of everything we do on that day. So Vyasa Puja Day has gone. Now it's what we could say is a normal day. So a normal day consists of activities in Srila Prabhupada's service to uh, execute his orders so that we ourselves may become purified and help in his mission of spreading Krishna consciousness. And each Vyasa Puja day is a day when we... Actually, we should do every day, but especially on Vyasa Puja day, we have to come before Srila Prabhupada and say, well, here's what I, here's what I offered last year. Here's the sum total of my activities for last year. And please give me the strength and blessings to continue on your service for next year. So, we're starting off again. Activities, we have to offer everything to Srila Prabhupada, to Krishna through Srila Prabhupada, through the Parampara. So, undoubtedly there will be many difficulties in doing so. It's a great inspiration to remember always how Prabhupada went through so many difficulties to bring us Krishna consciousness. He was trying at home to preach, his family members were not interested. He was affiliated with different Gorya Mat groups and they appeared to be not interested in preaching except in a in a formal way. They didn't appreciate his plans for expanding preaching. He wanted to go to America. No one encouraged him. 
although several discouraged. And he went there, on the way he had heart attacks, so many things. He went there, no friends, no acquaintances even. Time's up. Yeah, actually time's up. No acquaintance. No, I thought it was a note for me. Please finish. Anyway, it made me remember. So many difficult. He was living in the Bowery, the worst part. Of, even the hippies didn't want. They thought it was too much for Prabhupada to live on the Bowery. The place was so bad that even the hippies thought it was bad. <laughs> He was living there, and then he, he was living with a boy who he thought might make a nice Vaishnava. Then one day, one day went, in drug, went on drug-induced craziness, and Prabhupada thought he might want to kill him. So Prabhupada went, ran out on the street, and he never went back to that temporary abode again. And on and on and on, so many different... You don't, you, in the Srila Prabhupada Lilamrita, you'd only see a very... Very little of the difficulties that Prabhupada went through because so many things are not reported. Uh, one thing because how much can you report in, a, in one book, even though it's a big book? And another thing is because not everything should be reported because most people can't digest. They, they can't imagine that Saintly persons have to, or, or spiritual organizations can have so many rumblings and tremors and volcanoes. Sometimes we think, well, you know, iskon has been, it's had a really rough history after Prabhupada. It had a really rough history when Prabhupada was here. We don't know many of the things. Prabhupada was locked up by his own disciples for several days at one point, for instance. So, and Prabhupada went through all that because he wanted to give Krishna consciousness to others. He went through the difficulties of setting up an organization and overseeing it, knowing well the perils, we were just discussing that, setting up an organization. He had already seen the Gorya Mat, how that great organization set up by a great Acharya splintered. And so, but still, Prabhupada set up an organization with so many headaches. He himself took so many difficulties. In his old, we don't know what it's like to be in old age. We don't have memory in this life. While we're young, we have lots of energy, but in old age, the body is simply a cause of pain. A Prabhupada, in, of course, he's transcendental, but at the same time, it's just like Lord Shiva must have felt pain in drinking this poison. So Prabhupada, his body was certainly, he had very, he was, was, at least from the external vision, subject to various diseases and difficulties of old age. And Prabhupada accepted it all for the sake of purifying us, helping us, helping others to come to Krishna consciousness. So this is a great inspiration for us that we shouldn't complain. We have almost certainly an easier path than that of Srila Prabhupada. So, let us push on his mission, do whatever is required to please him. Even to be a devotee, still, it's, it's a non-conformist activity, which to be a devotee to be, means to be somewhat well, actually, to a large extent, estranged from mainstream society. And 
we don't like that. Human beings don't like that. We don't like to be against the grain. To, but So it, it may be difficult. I mean, how can I go my whole life being different? But, but uh, that's an austerity that devotees accept. Because we want to, we're on a different path. We want to go on the path back to Godhead. The, the conforming with the norm means following the path back to an, another mother's womb. Punarapi jananam punarapi maranam. Punarapi janani jatare shayanam. Again and again getting born, again and again dying, again and again having to enter a mother's womb. So, I don't have much time. But again, I'd like to thank you for pushing on Krishna consciousness in this God-forsaken land, forsaken by God, but not by Prabhupada. He's more merciful. He came here very kindly. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Do you want to say something? Yeah? yeah. Question. question can be short, doesn't mean the answer is short. If praise of devotees is good if offered sincerely, it's good for those who say it, it might not be good for those who hear it, who hear the praise. <clears throat> so if one hears praise of oneself, one has to immediately offer that to one's guru. And Jogata Bichari Kichunahi Pai Tomara Karuna Sha. If you examine me, you'll find I have no qualities. Your mercy is all that I'm made of. If you try to accept it for yourself, you get indigestion, which causes us to fall down. So it is a paradox of Vaishnav society that Vaishnav should praise each other. It's natural to praise it. But then you shouldn't want to listen to that doesn't mean that you should think, well, I'll insult him, and then he'll be happy. And then that becomes an offense. Anything else? Please. Oh. Yeah, how do you sound? Yeah, I want an advice. You said that um, the basic desire for a sense that it can be a sense that person is like, um, even if you follow the principles uh, and the uh, rules and regulations, but still you don't sometimes watch a movie or whatever, TV or something. But you know that yoga and spiritual life is balanced. So how can I, uh, with my daughter, uh, how can I, um, it's like... If you what is balance in spiritual life? Yeah, sometimes if you... But Lord Krishna yeah. speaks about that in Bhagavad Gita, doesn't he? He says, Yukta Hara Vihara Sa, Yukta Cheshta Sa, Karma Sa, Yukta Swapnava Bodha Sa, Yoga Bhavati Dukaha. That by being balanced in eating, sleeping, viha, which means recreation, uh, eating, uh, Yukta Hara Vihara Sa, and in different endeavors, one can mitigate all miseries by performing yoga. So balance is required. What is balance for one person won't be bad. Everyone has a different balance. But the basic principle of all activities for devotees is Krishnarte Akila Cheshta. All activities should be formed for Krishna's sake. So even if we, for instance, do some exercise, we should do so thinking that this body is given to me to serve Krishna. So I, I'm doing this so I can keep fit for serving Krishna. We should think like that. 
I can only give you a general answer. I'm not going to come and, you know, watch over you each minute and say, now do this, now do that. You have to use some intelligence for yourself also. Yeah, please. Had a question? You want to say something? Um, you mentioned when you even get beyond all these gross sinful activities and uh, you come to the moral suffering. Uh, then you talk about pratishta is the desire for, for yeah, recognition. Desire and for recognition. Said, this is the most abominable uh, material desire. It's like a stool, but it's also the most difficult to get rid of. Mm. So this is like a parrot. It's the most abominable. It's, it's the, the worst, difficult. but it's it's the worst, but it's the most difficult to get rid of. Why is the desire for prestige the worst? Well, one reason is that it's hypocritical, because one's showing oneself to be saintly, while actually he has other motives. Another reason is it's, it's subtle. We ourselves may not even be aware of it. We might be thinking, I'm doing it for Krishna. Or we might think that, well, I need this prestige so that others will respect me, so that I can pre they'll recognize my preaching better. One accepts, a sannyasa was introduced into the Vaishnava Parampara, reintroduced by Bhaktisthan Sastra Thakur. One major motive for doing so was so that people would respect the preachers. So, specifically, so they would be respected. So, one... So, it is required that preachers be respected, but on the other hand, if they forget why it's required, and if one starts to think, you know, why are they not respecting me? Then there's trouble. Mm. Oh, and uh, did I, I didn't finish answering the question. Are there the paradox? Yeah, well, that's the answer. That uh, That's some of the reasons why pratishtasha, the desire for prestige, is the worst. And it also goes against the whole spirit of Krishna consciousness, which is that, which is that all prestige should... Everything's meant for Krishna. If one has some desire for material enjoyment, like you know, someone is doing some extracurricular activities to Krishna consciousness, that's one thing. But then, if this this desire for, I'm not saying that's good, I'm not encouraging it, but but uh, this desire for prestige it, it, it eats one's whole being, so that everything one does, instead of being Krishna akila cheshta everything being done for, for Krishna's sake, then everything is being done for one's own prestige's sake. Yeah, there's some question. Please ask. Uh, who is it that should determine one's chosen sphere to master uh, the part from the sphere to master the master sastras or the scripture and the same part of the scripture? Well, if, if you find someone who's doing that, that's pretty good. If you find someone who you ascertain is doing that, then accept them as a spiritual master. So lucky to have, if you find there's choice. There's so many great souls. <laughs> if you find whoever is following Shastra, following Prabhupada, acting in Krishna consciousness, is certainly worthy to be taken shelter of so if you find anyone like that, then do it. It's very well worth and you're lucky. It's if you have a dilemma that there are so many great souls like that, you, it's uh, lucky to be in that position. So not every spiritual master do that. No, I'm not. I'm saying the opposite. There, there, you, there are so many. You're so lucky. There are so many. If you're, if you're not sure, then pray to Prabhupada. That's all. But anyone who follows these criteria, they're certainly worthy servants of Srila Prabhupada to, who, who transmit the same message. That's what parampara means. Yes, I mean, sir. Well, in a sense, duplicity we're all maintaining, isn't it? Because we don't, 
I mean, we're all trying to become purified. If, if we were actually to go around telling everyone what's in our hearts, then we, you know, we'd all become discouraged probably. We, we all try to act on a... Sadhana bhakti means to act on a platform that we're, we might not be at. We're, we're acting. If we follow the principles of Krishna consciousness, then we act on a, like the activities go ahead of our, of our consciousness. So first comes physical involvement, but getting the, getting the mind in the right bracket, that's the more difficult thing. But if we're sincerely trying to serve, and we're not pretending to be something more than we are, then that's not duplicitousness. So in one sense, we're all, the very process of Krishna consciousness brings us to act on a platform higher than where we are. We talk on it, you know, I'm talking, you know, we have to get out false prestige. And all that. I'm, I'm also, fie on me, I'm also, you know, I'm, I'm in the same boat. It's easy to talk, but actually being free from false prestige and actually being on the spirit, it's easier to talk about it, but then if we don't talk about it, we're never going to get there. So we have to talk about it. Yeah, what was your question? It's like you mentioned that uh, one should do everything for Krishna. Yeah. So it seems that it's just like some decision in the heart, uh, determination, uh, but at the same time, uh, one's very attached to it, one's material desires, which one may be actually cultivating subtly. Um, yeah, I'm just like asking. Therefore, we should associate with devotees who help us to get free from our anarthas. Shanta eva se chindanti, manovya sangam ukti bihi. Devotees, they, by their strong words, they cut our material attachments. What is it then that makes one choose one uh, uh, bona fide spiritual master above the other uh, for initiation? Sorry? What is it that makes one choose uh, this personal choice? Personal choice? You can choose to approach someone, but you, whether or not they accept you is something else. We talk about choosing a spiritual master, but yes. you, can, you can go and beg to be accepted, but you can't choose. I, I want to choose this one, you, like this one or that one, or which one's in fashion these days. It's it's not like buying a pair of socks. Blue socks are in fashion today. Now green socks, and striped socks. It's not like that. I discussed it somewhat in this book about accepting a spiritual master. You can also read that book, The Spiritual Master and the Disciple. It's an anthology of Prabhupada's teachings. I have to go, excuse me. Please, excuse me. I mean, I have to give a few minutes. For pe if, yeah, people want to take books. And there's, there's a few CDs here of lectures. There might be something about choosing a spiritual master. Or something.